Uh, we're going to talk about the tech stack of the metaverse. The first technology that we're going to have for sure is augmented and virtual reality. A common misconception of the metaverse is that it is only virtual, but I think some of the most exciting metaverse experiences will actually be augmented and real, uh, or at least physical based. We recently saw that Meta announced their Quest Pro, and I think that's really showing the potential of how light and maybe even comfortable and, and, and slim a VR headset really can be. And we also saw how mixed reality uh, pass-through is really innovative for business or education uh, use cases. So one thing that you can use in your metaverse stack is an AR VR headset. We also have a, a company called Vario. They have really high fidelity um, VR and, and mixed reality pass-through headsets. I think they refer to it as like human eye level like resolution, it's really high resolution. So if you are in the military or you're building for the military or for healthcare or for flight simulation or you know medical simulation and you really want high fidelity, you can consider uh, one of their headsets. Now the Quest Pro is standalone, you don't need a computer, the Vario does, right? So it just is considerably more uh, involved and pricey. I think it goes for like $5,000, so. More affordably though, Vario recently, I think it was maybe less than a year ago, they uh, released the Aero, which is like their consumer, prosumer level headset. It's, I think, $2,000. Uh, they even sell them at, at GameStops now. Uh, this one is, I think, also needs a computer. So it's PC VR. Um, it does not have pass-through uh, AR or mixed reality. So this is pure VR. So those are the really high-end AR VR devices. And then we can also go to, you know, the mixed reality or the augmented reality headsets such as the Microsoft HoloLens, which, um, you know, VR, it's fully enclosed. You can't really see your environments. And I think that can be kind of insulating and maybe even claustrophobic. So I prefer a really waveguide display uh, headsets, which are see-through. You can see the people in the environment. Um, it's, I think it's a little bit more um, down to earth. And then we have Snap. So uh, all the hardware that I've shown you is usually a bit bulky. It can still be heavy, so it's lighter, it's, it's, it's slimmer, but it's still pretty heavy, and it's meant to be indoors. But Snap is one of the innovative companies that are, are trying to build glasses that are out and about, the everyday, on-the-go glasses. It's kind of like an Apple Watch, but for a face wearable. And I think that's probably gonna be much more widely used than a ginormous headset that you have to sit down or be very careful in your environment, you know, operating um, like a, or, or, or being in a virtual uh, experience. So that was, I think, a snapshot of like the AR, VR um, headsets and the hardware that's currently, I would say, state of the art, but accessible, uh, or you can at least buy it. It's not like pie in the sky doesn't exist. The second technology in our tech stack has to do with sensory feedback. And what do I mean about, by that? One example of sensory feedback is spatial audio. So for any of you that you know, are creators or YouTubers or just into video, the rule is always that audio is 55% of the experience. If you have crappy audio, no one will watch your video, even though video is like the visual prominent thing. And so I think in the metaverse, we're very much gonna have the same thing. The true immersion, the true presence, I think will come from audio being really immersive and really like delicately uh, produced. And so several APIs that you can use right now that are essentially spatial audio APIs to have like, you know, a 3D based uh, audio source is Dolby. So Dolby.io uh, um, has their API. And we also have High Fidelity. So High Fidelity was created by, um, I think one of the co-founders of Second Life. He has since gone back to, to uh, work on Second Life again, but this also allows you to have kind of like a spatial um, audio setup uh, in your metaverse. And I think that's gonna be crucial, right? Because imagine it being in a metaverse experience and someone talks to you, but it feels like it's like right in your ears and they're there. That's kind of weird. So I think spatial audio is gonna be equally, if not more important than the visuals in AR and VR. And I think this is what we've seen in 2022 to be really on the rise, and that's artificial intelligence. You may have heard of DALI, or mid-journey, or all these artificial intelligence algorithms that generate images, textures, um, meshes, 3D models, all from just natural language. And you may ask, why is this useful to the metaverse? The metaverse is gonna be a vast, vast space. And to populate all of those, digital artists would either be really expensive or overworked. And so if users and builders can just say, oh, 
I want my metaverse to have this bag on, add a mountain there, make that fluffy. Like if you can just speak and create your virtual or augmented world, that will scaffold and speed up development. And so I think AI is gonna be more important maybe than crypto in the next three years for the metaverse. Now, this is where it gets cool, right? Because images are good for our current internet, but the metaverse is 3D. So what AI can generate 3D for us? NVIDIA uh, in the Toronto AI lab is working on generating meshes and 3D objects from images. So if you have an image of a car, it can generate the 3D model of it, which is really cool. And I don't know if you've heard of Dream Fusion. This, I think, is uh, Google Research and uh, UC Berkeley but they allow you to create 3D objects from text, which I, I believe all of this is open source, by the way. So I have GitHub links included. So this is open source. And I think the comment section would probably blow up and I, I would be you know, probably judged uh, really harshly if I didn't include blockchain in the metaverse. And I think the reason why blockchain is so important is you know, we can't have a single authority or country kind of dictating this vast space that kind of transcends the physical world, for it to be truly open and interoperable, I think we need a decentralized protocol to kind of be able to transfer assets, to have virtual currencies, so that we essentially can transcend our, our borders. Um, so, I mean, most people know Ethereum, uh, but Ethereum is one of the most well-known platforms that has these protocols for things like NFTs, to create your own coins or virtual currencies. Um, and while I, I don't agree right now with the climate impact and the cons energy consumption of protocols like Ethereum. I think they are a blueprint of what we could be doing for decentralized protocols. Well, actually, they recently, finally, after a few years, did the merge. So they converted from proof of work to proof of stake. So they're much more environmentally friendly. I think they reduced the world energy consumption by like 0.2% or some percentage. Um, that was pretty significant. Um, so over time, they'll even be more friendly. Yeah, so I still think Ethereum is like the driver in crypto in terms of like adoption and you know, decentralized apps. And I, I'm, I'm really happy that they changed to like proof of stake to be more uh, you know, ego conscious. I think we have to be honest with like some of these technologies are kind of ignoring the climate, just like innovation at all costs. So, but yes, yes, it, I think the energy costs will go down and I'm sure they can figure it out. Yeah, and there's like, blockchains built on ethereum that are actually like carbon neutral or carbon positive um like polygon which is right there so yeah yeah so um there's also like these you know these additional layers on top of like ethereum so sam was mentioning and polygon allows you to do that so it, it sometimes also makes it easier to develop it because crypto you know i'm not a crypto expert so i just I, I curated this this tech stack, but I wouldn't claim myself being a Web3 or crypto expert. But you know, there's there's multiple blockchains. There's a variety of different flavors. Um, I think there's also Palm Studio, Polygon. There's all these different uh, tools that you can use. Do your research to figure out what's best for your experience in the metaverse. But I think we have to keep in mind that the climate. You know, we cannot innovation at all costs. We cannot just move fast and break things. Um, we have to do it responsibly. And then one cool tool that I found too, because you know, crypto is like really, it, it, it can be very confusing to have like a wallet and like all these phrases that you have to recover your wallet. If it's, it just, even as a technical person, it feels like, you know, you have cold storage and then you have like a hardware wallet and you have a software wallet and then you have it for the layman. I think that might be a little too uh, complex. And I think something like a tool like magic allows you to, I think, create a wallet with just like an email and like the API seemed very, um, seemed very friendly for developers, both beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So if you plan to build something for the metaverse and you want to have like, you know, like a wallet uh, that is like easy to use, it seems like magic could be an interesting uh, solution. So that was blockchain. So again, I'm not a blockchain expert, but I do think that most metaverse experiences will somehow have to involve the blockchain just because we, we would be advocating for an open and interoperable metaverse. And I think when most people will start to have a lot of fun is in the identity and self-expression. Um, you know, we have TikTok, we have Instagram, we have all these different social platforms. And the reason why they're so big is because people can express themselves in unique ways. Uh, they can be funny, they can, you know, dress up, you can, you know, they can dance. I think part of the internet is sharing what you love. And I think in a metaverse, that's going to be more visceral and more really immersive and, and you know, a, self, a sense of self-expression is going to be key. 
a, a big part of that is avatars, right? Because if you're, especially if you're in a virtual world, you're going to have to have an identity, and you may choose to have it resemble your physical uh, re representation or your, your appearance, or it may be completely different. Like you may be a giant robot and just like crushing stuff in the metaverse. I don't know, but a really common um, SDK or, or API f uh, for avatars right now is Ready Player Me, a play on the, the, the phrase Ready Player One, I'm, I'm assuming, and that's essentially cross-game avatars. So they have done, I, I think they have integrated over, I think, 4,000 uh, experiences or whatever. So that's, I think, one interesting thing, is like if you're going to virtually hop from experience to experience in this vast digital landscape, um, having, you know, being able to have your avatar along the way and maybe even render differently based on the native aesthetic, um, I think that's very important to have a cross-platform uh, avatar. And then some of you may have already seen or uh, heard of MetaHumans. Uh, MetaHumans is not made uh, by Meta, the, the, the company now that previously was called Facebook. Uh, but MetaHuman is a reference to Metaverse Humans. Unreal Engine created something really stunning here where you can have photorealistic, really resembling what a physical appearance of a human looks like um, as an avatar. And the reason why it's so stunning is that previously, an artist would have to use ZBrush and Maya and spend weeks just crafting a, you know, a physical uh, or a photo real uh, human being in a digital space. And MetaHuman makes that probably 10 times easier. Uh, we can literally use MetaHumans in our experiences. Um, and so as indie developers, that's also why I created this tech stack. It should be accessible to most developers, not just for the few. And if you have to hire an artist and pay them 10 grand and four weeks of work, you know, that becomes less accessible uh, to all of us. So yeah, MetaHuman is really stunning work by Unreal Engine. You know, we can't have a virtual world or an AR, you know, an AR experience without real-time 3D creation tools. So those are the unity of the world. Um, I'm sure most of the people uh, here and also watching have heard of Unity. Unity is probably the most versatile game engine in the world, I would say. And we've also heard of, most likely, Unreal Engine. Um, they're two different companies, but Unreal Engine, I usually consider like really high quality, high fidelity experiences. But I, then, I think it's a little bit dif more difficult to learn than Unity. So if you're a beginner, it's probably uh, better to learn Unity. I can guarantee you every single metaverse experience will require a tool like this, because the metaverse is real-time 3D rendered. You will have to use this, unless you maybe do audio only. But I think 99% of uh, experiences will use this. And then finally, we have made it to the final technology in our tech stack. And I think that's uh, an interesting one that maybe not everyone will have, but I think they will, um, they will greatly benefit from it if they do. So the metaverse cloud, what is the metaverse cloud? So for those of us that don't know what cloud is, cloud is really just the infrastructure you know, provided by companies like Google or Amazon or Microsoft Azure, where you can essentially host, you know, your data, your algorithms can run in the cloud to essentially optimize it so not have it be on device, right? So for example, if you're building a metaverse experience with a Quest Pro, the battery life is about two hours. I don't think you want to run heavy, you know, algorithms locally. You want to send it to the cloud. One interesting tool I found by NVIDIA is called Cloud XR. And they essentially take the data from your AR, VR experience, push it to the cloud really quickly with low latency, render whatever has to be shown, and then sense it back. So it's almost like Netflix streaming, but for 3D worlds, which is really dope. And it works with 5G and like Wi-Fi 6E. So re it has to have a fast connection just because otherwise the latency would be very jarring. It would be like, oh, it goes up and then, okay, wait for it. That's like the buffering equivalent of YouTube, you know, back in the day. We don't want that. And, you know, Microsoft Azure, Microsoft is really pivoting also to uh, kind of like the enterprise metaverse offerings. And they have a bunch of technologies, um, you know, IoT, Maps, Digital Twins, uh, AI, uh, Microsoft HoloLens to kind of like build for this metaverse uh, that we're talking about. But I think those are the seven uh, technologies that we're going to probably see in most metaverse experiences. Um, you know, I'd love feedback, especially from the viewers of this video. You know, what do you think is the tech stack? Um, what are you building that, you know, might have some, some different technologies?